fights and so forth. Your country's one of mine is too. I think we have the ministry that was learned would always say from the point of land management, land use okay, and education, obviously. So for me those are my three priorities. <coughs> one, leaders should recognize the seriousness of this problem. Two, leaders should provide the legislative and the institutional um, mechanism for sorting out the contradictions that arise. And thirdly, they should take the, the guts, if I may use it, uh, to take these issues headlong. It's not sitting, it's not against trying blame, blame makers or anything like that, no. It's just accepting the reality. I think I'll just have to stop thank there. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you, uh, President Obama said when you wanted to jump in. Please go ahead. You know, let me tell you, for instance, this Kilimanjaro uh, society that we're building is, they sought political support, a word from some politician that would highlight the problem of reclaiming the, 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 the territory, I mean, the, the trees in Kilimanjaro as a way of attracting one age and certainly preserving the snow at the top. They found it very difficult, they found it very difficult to find anyone who was prepared to go out on the land in order to support this project of planting those trees. <laughs> so they came to me. Even I, to start with, was very hesitant. I said, I'm retired now, please, I don't want to. <laughs> but in the end, I sponsored them. They went right ahead and succeeded. So that's what I wanted to say. Well, that is uh, <clears throat> successful, which means that uh, we can go forward. There may be success stories all around that we can uh, emulate and uh, uh, copy. But there are three or four points that have been brought out that I want to bring together and see how in terms of education, in terms of what the ordinary people do, in terms of what um, those who cause chaos can do to stop causing chaos and all that. And I think this is the point that President Sagumbeki made about the child. Um, I was alarmed to know that the child, which 50 years ago uh, was the, one of the largest leagues in the world, has now shown to one thing of what it was 50 years ago. And if nothing is done in another 20 plus 20 years, there will be much sake of what I am doing last year. Um, and is it climate change? Is it human activity? I, I believe it is combination, like President Kosa said, combination of human activity and climate change. Um, President Kappa talked about others and customers, the problem that we have in my part of the world. And like he said, there are still people in our own part of the world, in Nigeria, who feel that the, the colonial uh, policy and regulation of uh, cattle wood and grazing land should be maintained. And I look into the desert of 1950s, when these uh, grazing lands and cattle routes were established. And one of the things that I found in the Nigerian context is that the major grazing land is where Abuja now occupies, the capital of the country. <laughs> but it used to be a deep grazing land. 
So if there is any distortion of uh, of grazing land and cutting in Abuja, it is greater distortion of that. Now, <clears throat> so that that is a reality. Then uh, and then, of course, we now have people who believe that the whole country, or indeed the whole world, is for them to create and send their cattle. And some even say their type of cattle cannot be uh, ranched. They have to go out grazing and destroying crops. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that shouldn't we really look at how we should live? The way we human beings should live. Somebody has talked about the issue of uh, population. I, I tried to look at the issue of population not too long ago, and I found that from 1960 or thereabout till now, almost all African countries have increased their population by a factor of five, or oh, except one. Nigeria was about 45 million when we became independent. We are now told that we are already over 200 million. Uh, <clears throat> and by the year 2050, we will be between 415 million and 450 million. Even if you take the lower uh, figure, 415 million will be a lot of population to deal with. If you judge by what we are doing now or what we are not doing, then I can see the factor looming ahead. So what do we do? Should we continue the way we are going or should we go a different way? Now it comes to the point that we have all emphasized, the issue of education. What is the reality? What, how do we get our people to even know that the danger that is looming ahead will be destructive? Destructive to ourselves, destructive to the environment. We are complaining about the environment. There may be no environment to complain about. Um, if we live, and there uh, may be no, we may not do the environment, whatever the name of the environment is there. But then the point is, can we continue to live the way we are living? Or should we really find a way of living that will harmonize our own living with the environment, with we, 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 we must also challenge, we be bold enough to challenge those who don't see things the way they can see. Now, for me, for me, it, 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 it beats my imagination that a leader in the world today, and a leader in the world today, will be saying that climate change is not a reality. Now, I'm not just a leader. But the leader of the, great, of the greatest uh, country in the world, I, I believe that should be something that we should talk about. Because there are some people who will take the cue from that. That if America says there is nothing to worry about, then there is nothing to worry about. While there is everything in the world to worry about, I believe that is greatest disservice to humankind. Wow, very, very powerful. <laughs> And I think, you know, clearly, ladies and gentlemen, a reminder that Africa must walk her own path. We don't walk anybody else else's path. We craft our path forward and we walk it. Um, you know, President Becky, you know, the tough question was put by Ali when he said, look, this economy around charcoal is massive. And so if we're going to shift things in some of these areas, and this is just one example, some tough decisions must be made. How do we push chaos makers to make the tough, correct decisions around critical issues like this. How do we move the needle? 
Let's lock them all up. <laughs> President Obasanjo, you're only saying that after you're out of office. <laughs> <laughs> President Becky, please. And he is saying that because uh, because of the things he does in Nigeria, he stands the chance of being locked up. <laughs> In, in fairness to him, by the way, he was locked up and he came out stronger. And, and so, yeah, thank you. You know, Julia, I think we, uh, this, this is a very interesting discussion on a very important topic. And I think part of what we need to do is start there, is to disaggregate this issue. So Ali here raised this question about the Great Lakes. Let's discuss that. It's an important issue. What therefore is the responsibilities, what are the responsibilities of the countries of the Great Lakes region with regard to looking after and the use and management of this great resource, as, as he was talking about the Great Lakes here. Yeah. It's a specific challenge. The people in South Africa and Namibia and Zimbabwe, they, they don't have that problem. We don't have those great lakes. But the countries here have a problem. It's a challenge. I'm saying this aggregate this issue like that. If you take the matter, you talked about the Amazon. Look at the African rainforest. Congo, Congo Brazza, Congo Smaya, Kinshasa. Uh, 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 Gabo and so on. The big, the big, big challenge there are the big foreign logging companies that are busy cutting down the African rainforest. And we are not managing that. The great expanses, we are losing great expanses of the African rainforest. The, our colleague from Madagascar spoke about this. But it's a very serious problem. <laughs> if, for instance, if you look at it from a different context, uh, the conflict that took place in the Central African Republic, a lot of it was a lot of it paid for by these loggers who come and they reach some agreement with some of the log of these things and cut down the streets and pay some of the money and so on. That's a specific problem. It's not all of us on the continent that have got those rainforests. But those of us who have, have a responsibility to say, what do we do to look after this? If the Amazon might be 20% of the land of the world, I don't know what we are on the continent with our forests, the rainforests, on the coast, which are very big but are, are under threat because of the, of the illegal law. Now, where President Bassan just says, lock up the politician, maybe we should. But one of the things they ought to be doing, stopping, is to stop this illegal logging, the cutting down of the African rainforest. But I'm saying that's a specific task. And I'll tell you the last story. The first German governor of uh, what was German West Africa, Namibia. And before he came to Namibia, he visited uh, Uzbekistan and discovered there in Uzbekistan the Angora goat, from which they get more hair. So when he got to Namibia, he thought the climate there was similar to what he had seen in Uzbekistan, and therefore imported Angora goats to Namibia, <clears throat> which some of which ended up in South Africa. And what's happened in South Africa in that context is that then the Angora goats then got into a, a semi arid area. There's enough vegetation there for the goats, uh, for those goats. 
And so indeed they are still there. But they're not a very serious economy. The people who are still, still got Angora gold farms there are really doing it more for weekend relaxation. It's not a serious economic thing, but they are there. The problem with it is that it has worsened the environmental conditions there. Because what those farmers did of the Angora goods, they changed the way in wildlife. So you get the degradation. It's clear that what needs to happen, if the South African politicians who should lock them up if they don't do that, is to remove those Angora codes and restore wildlife. And the area would recover if you did that. Now I'm mentioning that particular is because you may very well find that there are other areas on the continent which ecologically are about the same. And therefore you will be able to say, look, if we handle this particular matter in areas of this kind, which are relatively dry, this is a positive result that we get. On the last example, which our colleague again from Madagascar mentioned, overfishing. A country, for instance, like Senegal, you find that a lot of the people who are crossing the desert to Europe because Senegalese, Senegalese, a lot of Senegalese along the coast have fish as a traditional staple food. But there's been overfishing along that coast by one particular EU member state I will not mention. Huge depletion. <laughs> Huge depletion of fish stocks. If you see the problems that occurred in Somalia, off the coast of Somalia, when people talk about Somali pirates and so on, they don't talk about the source of the problem, which was overfishing and dumping of waste along that coast. What are we doing then about the management of those fish resources, as our colleague was saying? So I'm saying let's disaggregate the problem. Then it would be possible for us to say, having looked at this issue, uh, of the protection of the Great Lakes region in the interest of the whole continent and the world, these are the things we need to do. We need that. Otherwise, if we talk in general terms, we will remain on the general plane and not solve any problem. Thank you. But I think we can find the solutions in terms of the specific specificity yes. on our continent. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much for that. I see, I see you want to, to jump in, so please come in, Mr. President. Thank you. Je voudrais euh, réagir pour avancer sur euh, deux ou trois points importants euh, dont on avait parlé tout à l'heure, qui constituent d'ailleurs des, des solutions, hein, euh, qui rentrent toujours dans le cadre de, euh, de la bonne gestion des ressources naturelles. Donc on est d'accord qu'il faut que nos dirigeants politiques prennent vraiment leurs responsabilités en toute conscience. Donc là, je crois que la solution, c'est vraiment d'une bonne politique publique face à la gestion des ressources naturelles. Et là, il faut faire attention. L'État doit utiliser à la fois ce qu'on dit le bâton et la carotte. On va mettre en prison les trafiquants, on va sanctionner ceux qui détruisent les forêts, mais qu'est-ce qu'ils vont faire après il appartient donc à l'État de fournir la carotte, c'est-à-dire de créer des activités génératrices de revenus, par exemple, autour de ces, euh, ces ressources naturelles euh, sur lesquelles ils vivent. Donc ça, c'est la première euh, réaction que je souhaiterais euh, euh, avancer. Donc ce sont des alternatives euh, en termes d'activité économique, parce qu'il faut lutter contre la pauvreté, il faut qu'on améliore les conditions de vie des populations pour qu'on puisse lutter ensemble contre la mauvaise gestion ou la destruction des ressources naturelles. Le second point qui a été soulevé tout à l'heure et pour lequel je suis d'accord, second et troisième point, c'est éducation et information. 
mais pour lequel je vais apporter des expériences pratiques euh, que nous avons euh, utilisées à Madagascar. À des échelles euh, pas encore très larges, euh, dans le sud de, de Madagascar, euh, les populations euh, dans ces villages côtiers, euh, côtiers vivent surtout de la pêche. Donc, ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'au niveau de l'école primaire, donc l'éducation primaire, on enseigne déjà aux enfants, donc ça c'est spécifique, hein, ce n'est pas dans toutes les écoles de Madagascar qu'on le fait, mais dans cette région-là, on enseigne déjà aux enfants quels sont les types de poissons, les différentes catégories de poissons qui existent dans leur mer. On leur enseigne comment Comment vivent ces poissons On leur dit par exemple que pour les langoustes, il faut plusieurs années pour qu'ils grandissent. Donc, si vous attrapez des langoustes inférieures à 12 ou 14 cm, il ne faut pas les consommer, il faut les remettre à la mer lorsqu'on pêche. Ça, c'est un moyen pour conserver, pour que ça se développe pour que le stock se, euh, se développe. Donc ça, je crois que ce sont des, euh, des méthodes au niveau éducation à très court terme. Parce que n'oublions pas que lorsqu'on parle d'éducation, on veut changer des mentalités, donc c'est du très long terme. Mais il y a des méthodes de court terme qu'on pourrait euh, utiliser. Deuxième expérience euh, que l'on a, euh, a eue, c'est au niveau des régions euh, où il y a les forêts humides. Donc, dans ces forêts humides, euh, on a des lémuriens qui sont très spécifiques à, et endémiques à, à Madagascar, mais les populations détruisent les forêts parce qu'il y a des bois précieux dedans. Donc, on a enseigné aux élèves des écoles primaires et aux jeunes des écoles secondaires l'intérêt de préserver la forêt. Si aujourd'hui, on coupe la forêt, demain, il n'y aura plus cet habitat naturel. Demain, il n'y aura plus des animaux. Et demain, il n'y aura plus de touristes qui vont venir. Donc, c'est vraiment l'activité économique principale qui est le tourisme qui va être hypothéqué. Donc ça, c'est vraiment une éducation. On n'enseigne pas ça dans la capitale, mais on enseigne ça dans des régions euh, spécifiques. Une autre, une autre expérience en termes d'éducation, c'est dans euh, la partie euh, euh, un peu euh, au sud aussi, où il y a ce conflit justement entre les éleveurs et les agriculteurs. En fait, il y a beaucoup d'élevage et pour eux, les terres constituent vraiment un pâturage naturel. Et le problème, c'est qu'ils brûlent, ils brûlent les terres pour que ça constitue, pour que l'herbe pousse et que ça constitue euh, donc de la nourriture pour, le, pour les ébus. Et on leur a enseigné, on leur a éduqué en disant, mais ces terres-là, vous pouvez les cultiver, cultiver de l'herbe pour que ça constitue du pâturage, des pâturages pour, euh, pour l'élevage. Donc, moi je reste dans cet aspect pratique en disant, voilà, il y a éducation, faisons le discernement entre éducation et information aussi. Parce qu'il y a un aspect information là-dedans, parce que les gens ont du mal à, à, à s'imaginer que les ressources naturelles, leur environnement, c'est un capital. Ça, il faut toujours enseigner que c'est un capital. Pour eux, la nature leur a fourni ces ressources naturelles, donc ils pensent qu'on peut jouir de ça indéfiniment. Et moi, je leur dis, je le dis en tant que lorsque j'étais président, faites attention. Théoriquement, ce sont des ressources renouvelables, parce qu'on plantait des arbres, les, euh, les poissons euh, se régénèrent, etc., etc. Mais attention, s'il y a surexploitation, surexploitation, on risque de ne plus pouvoir avoir ces produits-là dans l'avenir, c'est-à-dire que ils ne seront plus renouvelé ni renouvelable et c'est ça qui est important. Oh. Thank you, thank you so much for that.
we seem to be entitled, we feel we are entitled, we don't understand the value of what we have and we need to appreciate that and you've said education is key, information is important as well. I'll tell you a bit, a small story. A lady told me uh, about attending a school event um, and they were walking out of the school hall. In front of her was a father with his young son who was carrying an empty soda bottle. He had been drinking the soda in the hall. And the young man is carrying it out and the father says, why are you carrying that empty bottle? And the young man says, I want to throw it in the dustbin. The father says, what nonsense, grabs the bottle from the child and throws it behind them into the hall. And you know, I say this because very often we as the adults, we as the leaders, we are the problem. And the hope that we can instill in our young Africans, so idealistic, if we get it right educating them and informing them, they will be custodians. But we must be aware of the negative things we do. Right from that start, littering, um, misusing, and depleting what we have. Ali, I come to you now. Oh, and before I come to you, let me just ask a question. How many of you were aware of the Somalia situation and the fact that actually the Somali pirates were a result of exploitation of the seas and their attempt to protect um, their ocean? So a few hands. Can I just see how many hands? Very interesting. So if we go to Europe and try to overfish on the shores of their uh, waters, we will be arrested, thrown in, we might, be, we might be drowned or allowed to drown right there. But when we do it on the continent, we are pirates. Yes, do we see that? How we are perceived and the stories that are told, and yes, it may have been informal. And, but there was a genesis of that, and I think Africa has to really and salt and the stories that are told. And so, Ali, I come to you with this, and also, you know, I call, the Israeli approach, um, I, you know, I, I've coined that phrase. A friend of mine who is in, in policy in Israel said, have you not noticed what we do, Julie? We never stop to discuss things with people. We do what we want, and then we deal with it later. We're not interested in sitting down and negotiating with everybody. We'll handle it later. Is it time for Africa to say enough is enough? We need a different approach, an approach that we are boldly, protecting, preserving, conserving our resources and stopping exploitation, uh, especially by external forces and then internally. Do we need a new approach, Ali? Mm. Mm. It's easier said than done. En enough is enough. Enough of what? Is there consensus across the 55 different African countries? Uh, but uh, there is something else. One fundamental difference I've seen between us Africans and the rest of the world is that we easily get overwhelmed by problems. We see them as unsolvable, and we are needy of help by other people. And it's through this condition of constant need of assistance that we have not been able to free ourselves from constant exploitation by others. And therefore also the inability to make the decisions that we need to make, including these which are going to be considered as controversial. And I'm going to give some examples because now I think we need to come up with some solutions on what needs to be done. Uh, I recently spoke at a conference in Addis about pharmaceuticals, industrialization in pharmaceuticals in the Horn area of Africa. <coughs> and it was interesting that everybody spoke about how there are so many illnesses in Africa and how there are so many problems and how we need help from everybody. And this theme has repeated itself forever. I think nobody has ever seen the pharmaceuticals industry as a business, as a profitable business. It's actually, if you ask me, the most profitable, biggest industry ever. 
that grows every single day, but nobody wants to talk about it. You will hear about the performance of different stocks of some pharmaceutical companies. But put together, it's the biggest industry in the whole world, pharmaceuticals. And who has the biggest number of illnesses? You know how much money Africa spends on pharmaceuticals every single day? $90 million every single day. And we say this is a problem. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to industrialize. Most of the pharmaceuticals we buy are not rocket science. The biggest number of illnesses that we have to fix are ordinary illnesses that each, every one of us knows. Malaria, TB, whatever, fever, diarrhea. Not the most complicated ones. But nobody, apart from a few industries in Egypt and South Africa, nobody in Nigeria, nobody in Africa manufactures pharmaceuticals. But of that $90 million that is spent every day buying pharmaceuticals, you know where it comes from? 80% from the presidential fund for HIV relief in the United States, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Global Fund, I think there is somebody else. We have completely outsourced taking care of the biggest problem that Africa has, but also of the biggest opportunity to industrialize. So what we are proposing in Addis is that actually here is an opportunity to industrialize. It's not easy. It's one of the most protected industries, especially because most of the drugs that are already available are patented, they are owned by others. But as a continent of 1.3 billion people, if we decided with the power to buy drugs worth $80 million a day, we can do whatever we want. Now come back to the environment. I used the number $75 billion in Tanzania of unmonetized energy expenditure every single year in this country, bigger than our GDP, deliberately. Some people may want to see it as a problem, but I see it as a huge opportunity. Just look into the future 50 years from now. People are going to be driving electric cars. Who has the material that makes electric cars? The raw material. Who has it? Africa. The fourth revolution is not going to happen without Africa playing its ball. But if we continue playing our ball the old way, it's going to happen without us. And we are going to buy the electric cars from there. But manufacturing a car is not rocket science. It's just putting a battery in the boot of a car, and it starts driving today. <laughs> the material to make the battery is available here in Africa. So imagine if we decided, as we have decided in most African countries, that we want to build industrial economies. But as President Becky says, let's disaggregate. Let's be specific. What kind of industries? In a book that I co-authored three years ago, we proposed Africa could actually, if it was bold enough, be the world leader in energy industries 30, 40 years from now. Because we have what the rest of the world doesn't have. But if we continue collecting some rents and exporting these minerals to somebody else to go and make those things, and then import them as you always do, that's going to be an opportunity lost. And it's going to be an opportunity lost because we have not changed our mindset from looking at challenges as opportunities. Instead, we continue to look at challenges as this terribly overwhelming situation. We're going to die. Somebody has to come and help Africa. So let me there. Thank you. Oh, Africa maskini. Uh, Julie, so hang on. Let me, let me finish his answer. Thank you. <laughs> The question that you raised is, is very important about uh, does, does Africa have the strength 
to stand up and, and defend its own interests against the rest of the world. And it doesn't. That's a problem. It's a particular challenge. Yes, indeed, the question is correct. Why? Uh, then give me a, a, a small example. They, we, you know there was this fight, I don't know whether it's over, <clears throat> between ourselves on the continent and the EU about the uh, uh, economic partnership agreements. So uh, then one of my colleagues, I was still in government then, in, from West Africa, he calls me and he says to me, can you please talk to uh, President so-and-so, somewhere there in West Africa, and ask him not to sign that economic partnership agreement. So I said, sure, I'll do that, because he says, because he's, he's, he's going to sign and it's going to break up this solidarity among ourselves. So I said, okay. So I did I call, I won't mention the names. Uh, when you finish, I mention the names. <laughs> He will. He, he would know the. He will know the names, and so he can mention them. Oh, you you can mention the names too. So I still, I speak to his excellency. I say, Your excellency, please don't, don't sign. And he says to me, but so and so is going to sign. I say no. I can. I guarantee you 100 percent that so and so is not signing. So he said, fine, all right, in which case I won't sign. And then he says to me, but so long as my stomach allows me not to sign. I said, now, President, you'll have to explain that. And he says to me, you see, the EU, <clears throat> at some point, will want to apply pressure on me to sign. And they have sufficient power to starve me until I sign. And when they do, I'm afraid I will have to sign. So I said, no, sure, I understand. I think people here in East Africa have similar experience of that kind. I won't mention the countries again. <laughs> same, same, same problem. When they can tend to squeeze on and you are exporting something to the EU, it's entering duty free. If you don't sign the EPA, they say we're going to impose duties on this. And countries, have, we've got to say so, we agree. Now, it's a real challenge. Now, I'm raising this thing, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing it, the thing that Ali was saying. I'm saying it's because it's an important challenge to address the duty thing that you're raising. And I'm saying it now the way I am because of this meeting. Because I think one, what, one of the things that's critically missing is pressure from below. We're allowing the chaos makers at the top to get away with doing nothing. But there isn't on the continent a strong enough movement from the masses of our people to say, you, our leaders, do the right things. It isn't there. And it's collapsed over, collapsed over a number of years. The, the, the political forces from below that would apply sufficient pressures for our leaders to take the correct positions over the years has declined, 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 declined. And we're allowing our leaders to do wrong things. And the people are quiet, they are docile. They complain quietly among themselves. So I'm saying that instead of complaining about the chaos makers, we need to respond as our populations. I think that's the only way we're going to be able to overcome this problem. Thanks. Thank you for that. And it takes us back to education and uh, information. Uh, President Obasanjo, you can come in. Thank you. I, I don't agree with <laughs> <laughs> President Abombeki. <clears throat> and I agree with Ali. Um, let me first of all say the area I don't agree with Ali so that I can come and deal with the big fish. <clears throat> Ali doesn't believe that tree planting is very important, which President Nkapa advocated. 
And what President Kappa said is that this is probably the cheapest way of dealing with forestation and environment and um, um, climate change. And I agree with that. There will be a number of other measures that we have to take. The tree planting, which can be done without uh, any uh, going for anything scientific and, uh, and each community, even each individual, each family uh, can do it. So, um, Ali, I don't agree with you uh, saying that that is not important. No, I said, I, I, I said it's a good thing. Okay, all right. If you I'm said just it, concerned if, that it's not enough. Okay, if, yeah, yes. it's not enough. Yeah. But that, that, yeah. that is so important that if we start with that, other things will come. And then together we will get there. Now, I, I don't agree with um, uh, President Abumbeki. President Abumbeki, you know it. You know it, and you know it, that we have had occasions in the past when we have stood up to these people, but we haven't stood singly. We have stood together. And for as long as we stand together, I believe we can stand and really uh, we are stronger than we think we are. Uh, and that, I believe, is the type of mistake we make, that we can't do it. We cannot do what? Now, I, I don't know, maybe the people you are talking about are the same people that uh, I will be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> now, cocoa is important. The three countries of Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana and Nigeria produce 75% of cocoa in the world. 75%. And the price of cocoa is not dictated in Africa. It's dictated from outside Africa. And the people who, man who manage and manipulate cocoa are about three or four companies in the world. The total uh, revenue industry, money from cocoa, and cocoa um, subsidiary and all that, is about $125 billion per annum. Only $9 billion goes to cocoa producers. Nine out of $125 billion. Now, if the three countries of Nigeria, Ghana, and Côte d'Ivoire can come together. And all they need to do is provide facilities for storing their cocoa for one year. They will be able to control the price of cocoa in the world. And they will be able to manage what happens to cocoa. Why don't they manage? Okay. No, 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 no. I will tell you why they haven't done Huh? I, I will tell you why they haven't done it. The four, the three or four companies that manipulate both the transportation, the storage, the processing, and the distribution of the uh, product of cocoa will stop on their, in, in their way to do it. We are now trying to get out of that because we need the fund to Thank be you. able to produce what we need to produce to be able to store for one year. African Bank is now working with the three countries to be able to, to get to it do. done, to get yeah. it done. That so, before we were not, we didn't have any facilities to be able to do that. But with com uh, uh, facilities like, uh, or organization like Africa Development Bank, African Bank, and we, we can do a little bit more than we think we can do. Thank you. And thank that you. is the way to look at it. Thank you. Very powerful. Can I, can I, <laughs> can I hazard uh, to share? Yes, please, President. President Obasanjo yes. has, has forgotten to tell us whether it's the same leadership that would not work with him that is now working for the success that is imminent. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> 
Now we now we know. Well, I I think they cross up. With the, 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 there is a similarity. Okay, there's similarity. <laughs> You know, we started off talking about the local communities who use the firewood and saying that they are just trying to survive, yes? They're, they're living day by day. And as you tell these stories, as we talk, it strikes me that our leadership is behaving in the same way. They're saying, look, survival of today, if I get the money, if it's, it makes it easy for me, it's fine. And we need to shift that needle. We need to change things. We're being told it has to be bottom up. The pressure has to happen. But for that, we need the information and education. So all this is interlinked. I want to come to the floor now. Um, as we come to the floor, let's get the mic ready, please. I'm going to go to the floor. I remember last year, we kicked off the Africa Leadership Forum in Kigali. I quoted Marcus Garvey. And then Bob Marley sang it. Do you remember what they said? What did Bob Marley sing? Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. So I think this is part of the key thing we need to do. As I come to the floor, please, out of the box thinking, moving forward, what next? Um, let's start over here with the gentleman in the glasses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I've got a very practical uh, suggestion for the panel. But just very briefly to say, you know, I think we're putting a lot of responsibility on individuals and so on. But I think the rape of this continent uh, is something we need to look at in terms of, uh, as was mentioned, the fisheries, uh, the oil, the gas, every kind of extraction. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time with communities uh, across the continent. And you see the stuff going onto trucks, going to harbors, and being shipped off. And like from back in the colonial days, those countries become super rich. Their kids are taken care of. But we know in Africa, our kids are not going to have that future. And, and so my... Uh, Actually, our kids are dying trying to get into their countries. They are drowning, literally. No, exactly. Yeah. So, so my uh, recommendation to the panel, uh, so President Thabo Mbeki led a really important process around illicit flow of funds from the continent. I think it's time if this group can play a kind of guardian role on natural resources and maybe as a panel, uh, you know, do uh, work around uh, protecting the natural resources and, and maybe even doing some, you know, a report that can be used, uh, you know, by the continent. And just one last thing, uh, you know, when telecommunication ministers back looked at how do we leapfrog um, you know, to make sure everyone has access. They didn't uh, look at, let's give people house phones. It was mobile phones, right? Mm -hmm. So I think similarly, we need to think through on the continent. Um, you know, we've got sun. Uh, all these technologies we have. So why not employ our people, uh, you know, and, and let our Thank people you. own these technologies? Thank you. What's your, what's your, please introduce yourself. Uh, so I'm Puvan Modli with Natural Justice, based in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come to the gentleman here in glasses, and then... The gentleman on the second row. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Anuwa Tibwa. I am um, an engineer, and uh, President Mkapa engineers were also caused chaos by throwing spanners <laughs> into, into systems. So I'll throw one spanner. One spanner that I want to throw, first of all, we need to be very careful about the talk of climate change. It can be used, and I'm, I'm seeing it being used to hold Africa down. So we need to be very, very clever about it. And we really need to know what we are really discussing. One thing, for example, I'll say, and this one to you, President Mukabe, Your Excellency. Trees are not the biggest sequestrator of carbon dioxide. Oceans are. Most of the carbon dioxide is actually captured and stored by oceans. So the story that if you plant trees, you deal with carbon dioxide, and then you deal with climate change, is actually exaggerated. So there's a lot of exaggerations that happens in the climate change story. But, but before, and, we, and be, they deal, before we get confused, engineer, before you know? <laughs> we get confused, however, however, for other reasons then, is it still important to plant? Because exactly. I would hate for anybody to leave the conversation thinking trees are not important. No, no, they are very important. Okay, but what I'm you. saying is <laughs> we need to avoid putting a lot of energy um, and I agree with Al here, Al Mafruk, that it is not enough, okay? What else is enough? For me, I believe, we need to put a lot of our energies to deal with the poverty. And the poverty in East Africa is not resource poverty, it's mindset poverty. We need to deal with mindset poverty. 
And because basically Africa is actually rich. And from the concept that Al Mufruk was talking about, about industrialization, if Africa just said, we don't really need European markets for anything. We have got enough markets of our own. We, we get away from this mindset uh, poverty. We have got a huge market of our own. And that market, Africa, for example, now East Africa community, is spend $500 million per year to, exp to import rice from Pakistani. And we cannot even pay salaries of the East Africa community staff. But we're spending $500 million of poor people and actually taking it to Pakistan and Vietnam to pay for rice. While we can actually produce rice ourselves here. And that's my mindset poverty. And we need to deal with that by recognizing the power of our own resources. Even the number of people that we have in Africa now is the power that we need to turn into our advantage. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we have enough markets, absolutely. Uh, we need to be careful and very strategic about what we do. The gentleman here in the glasses on the second row, and then we'll move, we'll move to that. I see lots of hands. I'll try to get to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Harrison Karissa. I work for Worldfish in Egypt and Nigeria. Uh, I want to thank my colleague for talking about poverty. Uh, that is the point I was not agreeing with my uh, President, uh, His Excellency Benjamin Kappa, about Africa being poor. And I, I really refuse that because it is uh, something that we need to really get out of our mind. We are very rich. All these other countries are actually getting, they got rich from exploiting our resources, and they are quite, even, you even gave examples of that. So, mm. all this for, uh, for uh, logging and so on is not for our benefits, for other people. All this mining, they are. So, I want to talk about education. I want to agree with uh, His Excellency Obasanjo that uh, indeed we can win against the EU, because I personally won against the EU. As I just, we were two people in a big meeting and the EU are 20 and we still won. So what I'm saying is education is really key to getting these things right. There are pockets of examples of where Africans have been able to get it right. I was talking the other day with a Namibian uh, PS official and he was talking about how they have dealt with some other things, including mining in their own country. So, uh, sorry, Botswana, not, not, not Namibia. And these things are possible to do. I don't want to go into details. But one of the things that we are also doing as world fish, as far as fisheries is concerned, is that right now we have discovered this is the biggest issue. And in Egypt we have what we call the Fish for Africa Innovation Hub that we have just started. Why did we start this thing? We realized that Africans are not able even to do small things like fish farming. The technology is very simple, but very many countries are still struggling with it. Why? Because we have not spent enough of our resources to teach our people on how to do fish farming. So these are things that uh, we are now trying to do to help people. So this is a good chance. We are now Thank already you. dealing with um, over 13 African countries who are coming to get this help. I think this is really critical. Thank then you. the other Quite thing that I... Final I, I, point, please. Yeah, one more thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Africa requires strong institutions. Mm -hmm. And who will do these strong institutions? I think uh, the grassroots is very important. But I am crying for the time when governments themselves will want to say, let's go and have strong institutions, because this is the only way that things can continue moving, even when the politicians and the chaotic makers continue doing their chaos, things should be able to run in a country. And this is what we really need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just ask President Mkapa, because for sure he wasn't saying Africa is poor. I know he's very passionate about this. He knows the resources on the continent. So maybe, uh, President Mkapa, you can just clarify for the gentleman. Um, I can't, I can't, clar oh, thank you. I can't oh, clarify on behalf of for him. <laughs> what President Mkapa said is that, look, he didn't use the word that we are potentially rich. But if we are potentially rich, which is what we are, you are saying, but we are poor today. The, what you see in each African country is line of poverty. Is there crime poverty? Now, until you can, look, I went many years ago to an African country. The leader now is dead, so I, um, it doesn't matter. But he was, he was beating his chest. Look, we have this mineral here, we have that mineral there, we have this. And I was looking at him. And 
But until you take that mineral and you can turn it to money, and you can put that money and into other things, food and agriculture and manufacturing and all that. Now, that mineral in the, in, the, in, in, in the ground is really not of much use. So what President Nkapas was saying, and he used the word least develop, uh, developed. We are least developed. Whatever we may have in terms of resources, until we can turn it, until we can add value to it, until we can make it into something that will yield uh, money in uh, dollars or in euro, then we are, we are not there. And that we shouldn't deceive ourselves. We may be potentially rich. We are at this moment very poor. And that is why we... Wow. Yeah, wow. And, that, and that is why we are talking of transformation. Right. You have to transform from where we are to where we should be. Thank you. And we are not where we should be. Thank you. Can I, can I just... Am I, have I done the yes. job for you? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just, you know, to, to re-emphasize the point being made, we are a hungry continent and yet we have the greatest potential to be the food basket of the world. These are the contrasts and the ironies, right? We are the wealthiest continent uh, properly in the world and yet we are, as we've been told by President Obama, we are poor. We are poor. I just want to throw something at all of us right now, even as we sit here and try to define what wealth is. Now, I remember when I went for university abroad, we have avocados falling in our farms. We have mangoes on our trees, sometimes rotting, coconuts. And I went into a, a supermarket in the UK and I had yearned for a mango. And I went in and I looked at, there was one mango, a little mango, it was a little bit too ripe, you know? But I said, it's a mango. And I picked it and I looked at the price and I nearly collapsed. And here on our farms, in our villages, all these things are falling down, rotting. And I remember a Japanese person saying, I look at your maize. When we grow maize, we use every part of it. And we wonder, why are you people throwing away so much? So I just want to throw that challenge back out. How do we define wealth? And the things we do have all around us, how are we utilizing them? Young man in the red hat. Thank you. Are you a young man? You look very young. Um. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Moderator. Um, I'm Dr. Ola Bello. Um, I'm Executive Director for Good Governance Africa. Actually, I was going to tell um, your excellencies that, you know, people of my generation, you know, now knocking on 40, um, in, being involved in some of the policy processes um, to move Africa forward. We've seen one or two failed you know, things that have been promising. And I think before we give in to cynicism, maybe there, there are important things to report back. Um, Your Excellency has talked about the importance of education and um, also disaggregation. Um, when I relate that to the area of natural resource governance where I work, you know, one of the things I've seen over the last seven years during which um, I've been a member of the so-called um, technical working group of the African Union on implementing the African mining vision um, is that, um, you know, leaders um, make decisions politically. But I think um, there is a lot we can re um, achieve on the regional level and the continental level. And there are technocrats um, we saddle this with. You know, when people talk about poverty of the mind, I think it's also related to finance. A lot of what we see there is bureaucratic um, competition of the type that does not help Africa. And when the continent itself does not fund a lot of what needs to be funded, um, I think we simply, uh, it's about putting one's arm out um, where one's money is. Um, so in that respect, you know, three key things that I think um, as um, ex-president, I think you can help to influence, to maybe rescue what's um, going on with the African mining vision, because a lot of what we are talking about here, um, you know, is relevant there, and there are lessons that can be um, shared. Thank you. Broadly. As quick as possible, please. Um, very quickly, I think we need um, leadership unusual in three areas. 
Um, first, um, I think um, the ability to analyze, coordinate, and recognize um, one's self-interest is key. And I see that missing sometime in the um, African mind and vision process that I talk about. There is this instinctive hostility to everyone who comes from the outside. There are disruptors, there are those who are cynical, but if you cannot analyze, you cannot readily identify those who can help you. I talked about a few months ago on President Obama and Joseph's achievement with the Nigerian extractive industry. I think I would like to see this sort of um, proactive, positive engagement from our African technocratic um, leaders too. Um, I think um, the second point, and I will leave it there, um, is that we also um, need to, you know, maybe relegate the political, um, you know, to the technically, um, to the technically competent sometime. On this AMV process, we decided years back the African Union must be the lead political coordinator. Two, three years after that decision, it was clear um, that the requisite technical knowledge to lead did not exist within the AU itself. I think positively, there have been attempts to rectify that. But if you look at that, where that process is today, the so-called continental level partnership between the African Union, United Nations Development Program, UNECA, and the other players, is often more combative than productive. I thought I would throw that out thank there you. because there are things you can help with. Thank you. No, no, okay, thank you so much for that. I want to take a lady because we haven't had one yet. There's a, a lady on this. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, Excellencies, uh, all protocols observed. Uh, my name is Patricia Paul, and I'm from the United Republic of Tanzania. I actually represent the African Union Commission Youth Advisory Council appointed by His Ex Excellency Musa Faki. My recommendation actually to, towards too much la lamenting and finding solutions mm. uh, will be how do we invest in the young people, the young generation that currently is coming up with tangible solutions. We have a lot of young people who are turning waste management to produce charcoal. Uh, all the waste that has been sent into dustbin, trash cans, there are a number of young people who are actually using it to create charcoal, which saves up the firewood and the trees that are going to be cut down and burned down to still preserve our natural resources. My other recommendations will be how do we um, diversify the approach of uh, carbon solutions to protect our natural resources while mitigating climate change. From looking at education more in the rural communities and less in the cities, because still we have some people in the cities who are still not yet aware and that much educated, tapping on to what uh, Mr. Ali Mafruki said. Sorry if I, may, if I mentioned your name wrong. Uh, it's actually the fact that we put so much investment to the Allies in the cities to and leave aside the rural communities where they are the majority who use charcoal, mm. who have all this waste but still don't know how to best use it, how to best recycle it, how to best put it into use that we can still preserve our resources. Thank right. you. Thank you very much for that. Very good point. Can I take one more lady uh, who's in this me. row, uh, in this in this section? Uh, I think I see. Is that Zuhura? In the, yes, thank you very much. Lady with a grey, yes, thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much, Julie. Um, I want to go back to education. I think it's because I come from the background of education. Mm -hmm. But my solution, is we are looking for solution instead of lamenting, uh, I think uh, one thing we have to do is to go back to the traditional knowledge that mm -hmm. was there as a protection of environment. I grew up around Kilimanjaro area. As a small child, you are taught from infancy or when you start to have your brother, so you don't do that. So I think where we have gotten it wrong, it is when we have moved away from the traditional education. Mm -hmm. When we were protecting Mount Kilimanjaro without having anything undue pressure from the central government, it was known to the end. It was not known to the entire community what we are supposed to do when you go to the river. But that was taken away. That power was taken away from the, the, the communities. Taken away how? They were sent officers, natural resource management officers. They started selling our trees behind the back doors. 
and we were not even allowed to cut tree without having the, the, the permission from the traditional rulers. Mm -hmm. So I think as a solution, Africa, we have to really to do introspection, go back and say, what have we lost from our traditional education system, which was very protective of our environment? We didn't mm -hmm. have electricity, mm -hmm. but we are not cutting down trees. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent point. I'll try to take a few more. So there's a lady over there, and I see a gentleman over here. Yes. So. Thank you. Oh, uh, uh, the, the lady in front first, and then we'll come to you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Good, good morning, Your Excellencies. My name is Clara McKenna. I'm with UN Environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I cannot agree more with the importance, I mean, the already said importance of education in addressing this natural resources management. And I, I can say from all angles, at all level, levels, and in all aspects. And I would like just to point out on one specific aspect, especially in terms of educating and raising awareness with African political leaders. And this is on the natural capital accounting. And I would like to really uh, emphasize that most of the times, indeed, uh, there is, is there's no clear, there is no clear uh, accounting of the ecosystem services that are brought about by you know, of trees, for example. And my brother Ali just mentioned, and he gave us a statistic of uh, 90 million US dollars used every day on pharmaceuticals. So if a, uh, an African leader is really informed, you know, given those statistics on how health is that much costly, then I believe environment and natural resources management would be given, you know, their due weight. You know, so it's not like the environment and natural resources management are put under the carpet, whereas we are you know, running after education, running after health, running after all other things. So I think it's really the importance of natural capital accounting is really critical on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lady in the back. Yes. Another lady. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Another lady. Thank you. Thank you. That's very good. Another lady has been saying. Uh, thank you, um, all your excellencies, protocol observed. My name is Sophie Mjema. I'm the district commissioner of Ilala, where you are. Karibu Nisana. Uh, well, my question comes back to all of you, your excellencies. You had wealth of experience and knowledge, which now you're parting it with us. When I was listening um, to, at uh, your excellency, Obasanjo, you were talking about the other ones and um, the, you know, the other group. But I was trying to think that while you were in your term, while you were in leadership, was there any kind of mechanism which you came up with while you were doing these forums to help the Africans have the decisions when they get such problems? For example, the United Nations and the other countries, they've got their vote. Why shouldn't we have that in Africa so in future that we don't have the problem what we have right now? Thank you. That was Thank you. I, th I think I can start to answer the question that one of those mechanisms may be NEPAD and maybe you can talk more about that, President Obasanjo. But before we leave the lady, who is a leader as well, please give her the mic back. Just for a moment. Julie, why don't you Good. allow me to right, do yes. that now? Okay, thank you. But President Obasanjo wants to uh, respond. Uh, I'll uh, come uh, back to you, please. Okay, right, and, thank I, you. and I have an accomplice that can uh, join me in dealing with that. You know, and let me tell, this is a true story. In the year two, 1999, I think it was 2000, uh, President Abumbeki, you will remember, the G7 that I've just met, they were meeting in uh, Tokyo. And President Tabumbeki was representing non-aligned movement. He was the president of non-aligned movement. I was representing G77 plus uh, China. We had a meeting in Havana, and I uh, became the chairman for the first time. And uh, President uh, Buteflika was representing uh, OAU. Um, and the three different international organizations uh, separately asked each of us to meet the G7. And um, we 
on a different um, uh, at, at a different level, we went to uh, Tokyo, and they met us for probably 20, 25 minutes, and not uh, much, and they dismissed us. <clears throat> and they were going to Okinawa or somewhere to do hold their meeting where we were not supposed to be with them. So the three of us then came together. I don't know whether it was in your hotel room or mine, or, but we, we met, the three of us just met and we said, look, if we are here together, if these people have asked us, what is your plan for Africa? We wouldn't have been able to say, this is our plan. So there and then we decided that we should work on something. President Abumbeki uh, nominated, I think, Weissman? Yeah. I nominated an assistant of mine, and uh, President Boutiflika nominated an assistant of his. And um, we asked them to be meeting in South Africa. That was how NEPAD actually originated. And we did not stop with that. We did not stop with that. We went further to establish uh, APRM, which was um, uh, an outcome or a flow uh, out of uh, NEPAD. But what is particularly interesting and very important was that when NEPAD was established, we met the, the same G7 uh, in uh, Kananaskis in Canada, and for the first time, they said, well, look, this is an African program initiated, proposed, and um, developed by Africans. We will support it, and they did. Um, well, maybe um, President Tabumbeki will take it over from there. And the next, that was uh, that meeting in Kananaskis in Canada was 2002. Uh, it went back, the G8, went back to Canada in 2010. As President Obasanjo says that they had in Kananaskis, they had agreed to support this African program, NEPAD and agreed on what they called the G8 Africa Action Plan. Then we had a coordinating mechanism, joint mechanism between ourselves and G8 to, to follow up on the implementation of all of that. I'm saying the G8 went back to Canada in uh, 2010, that's eight years later, and the G8 Africa Action Plan had disappeared. They had abandoned completely the commitment they had made in 2002. Still, to this day, it's never come back. That's our challenge. <laughs> yes, maybe, you know, getting too effective, but it remains our responsibility. I, I realize NEPAD has now rebranded. It remains our responsibility. APRM is doing some incredible things on this continent, giving guidance uh, to, to countries on, on their areas of strengths and weakness. So, but we must do more. We must do more. To the lady, I had not left you yet. Can we give her the mic back? Because I have a question for you. So you've posed the question to our leaders, um, yes. and, and you are a leader yourself. That's so right. I would re and I think this is the important thing, is each of us taking our space, taking our responsibility, and taking ownership. Absolutely. So in your space, what do you see as the needs, and how are you addressing them, and how can make, we maybe work together to make things more effective when it comes to natural resource management? Oh, thank, thank you, you very much for that question. Thank you. Actually, what I wanted to know is that the leaders are there. They They've got wealth and knowledge of experience which they had all this time. However, there is being an obstacle that we cannot um, decide to say, no, I'm not going to sign that. 
that because there's a lot of pressure and we still depend on them that we want our things to be sold or to be exported at that time. So I was trying to look as Africa, as the whole of Africa, what should we have? Put a mechanism whereby at every at any given time, when we want to decide something, when we want to decide something for Africa, we should have one voice and nobody could say no to us. That's what I wanted to know. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That would be one of the most instrumental things we could do for the continent is okay. have one voice. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The gentleman, finally, I come to you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Your Excellencies. Uh, for me, the, there are, I mean, I have uh, questions. But one of the one of the things that has really been bothering me is Africa is the richest continent in terms of the resources, natural resources. But unfortunately, our resources they are taken out, then they are brought them back. This is the time I think to think through. Uh, our leaders they are here, those who have been our leaders from the beginning and those who are leaders today. You know our resources. Think outside the box after the independence, almost all of them they were killed. All of them. Maybe even uh, one of our great leaders here, like also Thabo Beke, maybe he may have also been a victim of thinking outside the box and you see what happens. What happens, Africans they are used to destroy themselves and we must move away from there and we must think through. Because every time a problem comes, somebody else is used to destroy you as if you, what, what happened to Gandhi? And you know what Gandhi stood for? How did he die? Why did he die? So when we are here also as Africans, we must dare to have a vision. And when you have a vision, that's what my proposition. When we have our vision, let us not go for anybody to fund our vision. If somebody is funding your vision, then it is not yours. Thank so you. here, the thing is, here, everybody here, our leaders they have spoken about education. When we are talking about education, what education are we talking about? My third point, I mean, just to end my sharing. There is, some, there is the question of research and development. As long as our governments are not putting enough budget, is the universities, our higher institutions of learning. What happens in our institutions of learning? I want to end, Julie. At that level, the professors, the doctors, people were educated at that level, they do not, I mean, they are not funded well. So when people are there in the universities, instead of our professors taking time to think through, to come up with ideas, to Please be upstanding for the arrival of His Excellency Dr. John Pombe Joseph Magufuli. Santenisana, we may now be seated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us. We will give you a summary of the discussions this morning. A young man over here was just winding up a call. My, my name? Introduce, introduce yourself. Oh, yes. Thank you. Joseph Ntoyeruaki from Pan Africa Climate and Justice Alliance based in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. That is a continental civil society organization. 
So I was saying here for Africa, we need enough money to our team. In fact, when people from Africa, they go out and they are the other parts of the world, they are part of spoke about the, the movement from within. Again, this is even the movement from the ground. Right. They are supported by somebody. The vibe and determines the tune of the music. That Thank is the problem we have. The problem of now. The people who are here, most of the people who are here, the intellectuals, they say politics is a dating game. Mm. So what do they do? They elect in that people. They elect people without brains. What happens? Oh they are the ones who make the policies that guide what they do. So with all your intellectuals, you are guided by the people who have no intellectual capacity. So they are the people who are given money for their stomach, they sell their country. Okay, for their so stomach, they sell their natural resources. Let us move on. Thank you. Wow, wow. <laughs> I've got to come back. I'm going to come back to the panel, ladies and gentlemen. We have to start wrapping up. I apologize to the hands that are up, but we have more sessions coming in a short while. Um, on the Gaddafi issue which you have raised, we discussed this in our peace and security panel a few years ago and, and, and it very passionately came out that mistakes were made and it should never have happened. And Africa must take control of her issues and determine her own destiny. You say to us that we shouldn't take funding for our key institutions. Why should we take funds from other people? And I'll bring that to the panel. You know, gentlemen, it's like saying, you know, a man goes to his neighbor to feed his wife and children and then expects not to have consequences to that kind of behavior. I'm not, I'm not suggesting what happens after. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, so is it, time for is it time for Africa to stand up and say we have to put, we have to fund our institutions, we have to build our own? And, and an interesting comment about the quality of politicians we have. Maybe as we, as we wrap up, and, and I will invite Professor to give a summary of events, but before that, maybe we start with this. Ali, let me start with you on the end. Um. I visited the AU head office in Addis for the first time two years ago. And it was around the time when we, as the private sector, were beginning to uh, build a coalition to support the establishment of the Africa continental free trade area. And as I walked around that building, the new building, <coughs> Uh, that was uh, built by the Chinese for us. I remember that uh, Baba uh, Obasanjo was there, and I was asking, it's very strange. I'm almost 60 years old. I've been in business for more than 30 years. I never had any reason to come to Addis before. This had no relevance to my life, to my business. And the same applies to most of my colleagues in the private sector. So what happens in Addis? What do our meters, our leaders go to do? But I found that in Addis Ababa, there's a very huge and powerful, powerful representation of global corporations from other parts of the world. For them, Addis has relevance. Another thing that I found is that the AU meetings are not very well attended by those who should attend them. But the most well attended meetings by our leaders are the ones that happen outside the continent. You know, right now, like in TCAT. TCAT, <laughs> everybody is there. FOCAC, for the Chinese. Except for the Chinese. 
I, 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 wanted, I wanted to reserve that for, for him. Fokak, they are there. We've started receiving invitations for Turkey next year in Russia. And I know they're all going to storm there. They go to meetings in Brussels, but not to Addis. And when they go there, they don't have a lot of time to discuss much. And that's the reason probably we don't have any reasons to go there. So we do not have affinity to our own institutions. The AU is struggling for funding of its own daily operations. I'm told the employees, I was talking to some of the people who worked with President Kagame on the reforms, that the employees of the African Union, including the very senior ones, don't have a pension fund. And these are people who are supposed to be doing some very important work for us. Right. And because they don't have a pension fund, they spend most of their time traveling to get daily support allowances to fund Fadia. themselves and mm. their children. Mm. They have no future in this very important career. I was told also by people who worked on this commission that there is more than 1,400 formal resolutions of the heads of state of the AU that have never been implemented. They found during this study. And nobody follows up. So we have a problem of these broken institutions that we do not want to fund, that we do not care of. But I leave, I may add, another but, thing that yes. you must add. Yes. They, are, uh, they, they create more institutions almost yes. at every meeting. So now, now, <laughs> now, 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 now look at. Okay. But, but now look at the world. That, look at how the world looks at us. Right. It's a conversation I'm, in go, I'm involved in uh, right now with some colleagues. And just asking myself, what the hell is going on? When we went to Addis a few months ago, just before the launch uh, of the CFTA, the EU announced in Addis, we had not even formally launched it, it was a month before. The EU announced they are setting aside 42 billion euro to assist Africa implement the CFTA. A few months before, following some agitation by US senators, President Trump announced a $60 billion fund targeting Africa trying to counter Chinese influence on the continent. The Russians have a, this big meeting next year. They also want to get to the game. Everybody wants to control Africa. The new scramble for Africa. Even the Arabs, even the Arabs, they see Africa as their sphere of influence. And they're dedicating huge amounts of resources. My question is, what yes. are we doing? Thank it's you. like you're a beautiful girl, and there are so many guys who want to get you. And I mean, the least you can do is at least choose the best. <laughs> Thank but, you, Ali. But to be Ali. Clear, not doing. So I'm saying that um, if Africa is going to continue down the old path uh -huh. that we've been on until now, uh -huh. it's definitely going to be not because we don't know. It's going to be our choice. We have to make plans for ourselves that we are going to lead by ourselves. We can learn from others, obviously. But we have to take responsibility for our own future. Thank you very That's much, Ali. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, you know, you talk of suitors, but the rape of our natural resources has already been mentioned. So even this young lady, she's already being exploited. She's being exploited. So, you know, how does Africa reposition herself now to get value for herself from her continent? It's complex, but we have to do it. Your Excellency Rajao Narimam Pianina, let me come to you now for your thoughts as, as we're winding up this session and we're talking through the whole issue of our institutions, investment into ourselves, belief in ourselves, repositioning ourselves to benefit from our own resources. What, what would you like to leave us with on this panel?
Je crois que... Yeah. Channel one. Thank you. Je crois qu'effectivement, il faut, il faut qu'on mette fin définitivement à ce paradoxe. Ce paradoxe que l'Afrique est riche, les pays de l'Afrique sont riches en ressources naturelles, alors que les populations sont pauvres. Il faut qu'on mette fin à cela. C'est vrai, il y a eu plusieurs réunions, plusieurs forums, mais moi, ce que je voudrais dire, il ne faut pas se décourager. Moi, je suis vraiment euh, très content qu'aujourd'hui, on parle, euh, on mette tous ces, ces problèmes-là sur, sur la table, encore une fois de plus, mais il faut qu'on amplifie. C'est notre rôle d'intensifier le message euh, que nous voulons passer aujourd'hui. Les problèmes que nous avons discutés doivent être appréhendés de manière systémique. Tout est relié dans tout ce qu'on a fait, tout ce qu'on a discuté aujourd'hui. Mais il faut savoir qu'il y a des problèmes dont les solutions devraient venir de chaque pays. Il faut que ce soit spécifique au pays. Mais c'est là où on doit se réveiller. Il y a des solutions qui doivent être prises de manière solidaire au niveau continental et au niveau international. Je reviens sur les problèmes de trafic euh, euh, illicite, que ce soit au niveau des animaux, que ce soit au niveau aussi de, de la pêche euh, illégale, mais ça, il faut une solidarité continentale. Madagascar sait très bien qu'on vole 500 millions de dollars dans ses eaux territoriales, mais il n'a pas les moyens. Il n'a pas les moyens aujourd'hui de, de lutter contre cela. Donc, il faut qu'ensemble, on se réveille, on réagisse par rapport à, à tout ce qui se, se passe aujourd'hui. Et, à mon avis, ce n'est pas nécessaire de créer d'autres institutions, mais les institutions qui existent, il faut qu'on amplifie, il faut qu'on amplifie leurs actions aujourd'hui. Et il faut que, au niveau de l'Union africaine, par exemple, on se saisisse des questions dont on parle aujourd'hui pour relancer vraiment le débat à un niveau beaucoup plus institutionnalisé. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We don't have a lot of time, uh, but we want to just wrap up from everybody their points of view. Please, Your Excellency, uh, Pres uh, President Becky, your thoughts on uh, uh, as we wind up, please. Thank you. Two minutes. <coughs> Uh, President Kappa has, has told me I can speak for 20 minutes. <laughs> the, the, uh, the President of Basanjo spoke about uh, the process which led to the adoption of NEPAD and the African Peer Review Mechanism. Uh, to complete that particular story, we, in addition to the three presidents who had met in, uh, in Tokyo, we then also at some point spoke to the then president of Mali and prime minister of Ethiopia. So we became a gang of five. I'm mentioning that because we used to meet informally as a group to discuss the challenges that uh, we're facing on the continent. And so that by the time we go to an AU summit, We've had some consultation among ourselves about particular issues. And so we'd be able to address the, the AU summit and say, look, we think this, we think that, we think the other. Which made a very important contribution uh, in terms of the work of the African Union. Uh, if I may, by, by President Magufuli, I do it with apology. I've discussed this matter with President Magufuli. Because I do come back to end this issue that we were discussing earlier. My true best feeling, President Obasanjo, is that that capacity, that possibility, that capacity, that the possibility exists, but it's not being done. Now, it contributes to the reduction of the sense of cohesion among us, and that's our reality. 
So, if we, if our colleague was raising this thing about the African mining vision, the problem about the, it's a very good African mining vision. Two years ago, I attended the African mining in Daba. And all of these mining companies active on our continent were there. They, they had absolutely no clue, this thing that Ali Mufurugi is talking about. They had absolutely no clue about the African mining vision. So our, our leadership had elaborated the thing and worked on it and so on, but the mining companies had absolutely no idea that there was such a vision. And the fault was with the AU. The fault was with the structure. It was not interacting with this private sector active on the continent. And I'm saying fundamental to that is that absence of this leadership as it was possible then to, to, to exercise and to give. Please, your comments. I, I will just um, present President Abumbeki got it right, but he left out <laughs> a very important, no, no, seriously, a very important point. You see, it was not only the five of us, if you remember. If there was anything that we need to carry President Ben Kappa, we have one of us who will get President Nkapa to carry him along. President Tabombeki, because he is too far from Gaddafi, and he detailed me to keep dealing with Gaddafi. So when we have an issue that we have to carry Gaddafi along or prevent Gaddafi from doing, <laughs> President, President Tabumbeki will sit back and say, you go and do that. <laughs> and, um, but, but the point really is what we have said. We, we have cohesion. Uh, a, a core leadership within the AU to mobilize consensus and make AU move together. And, um, AP, I think it was APRM. We didn't have, I think five of us decided we were going on with APRM. <laughs> Five of us, I don't know if they have had all the 55 countries now, uh, but five of us started, we were going with APRM. Then it became seven, I think it became um, 10. And when the lions start, the others will well, follow. We, 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 right. we follow. <laughs> now, I think the, the, this uh, is the point that in terms of policy, in terms of we really realizing that we are not as weak as we think we are. If we move together, individually we are weak. What? And we what? will be taken what? piecemeal what? and be chewed up. But collectively, we are not as weak. We have what it takes. It's just a question of bringing ourselves together. And, um, and I believe uh, I'm, I'm happy that the uh, uh, president is uh, here with us. Before you came, I jokingly said that if our presidents are not performing, we should lock them up. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> now that you are here, I will say you will work hard to prevent that being locked, to pre prevent being locked up. But, uh, but uh, on, on a very serious note, yeah. I, I think we, we, we can do it. And indeed, we must do it. And uh, what we have said here today, land use policy. And it's not only land use policy, land use, water use, and policy. 
We cannot separate land and water. They have to go together. Water use policy, land use policy, um, uh, what do we do with climate change, what do we do with the environment, what do we do with the conflicting, the uh, herders, the uh, crop farmers, how do we handle it in, in, uh, in our own different societies and get harmony and get togetherness. Um, but Thank you. I, I am an incurable optimist about things in Africa. I believe we will get there. So we have to work. We must get there. We must yeah. get there. Thank you very, very much. Your Excellency, uh, Benjamin Kappa, please, if you share your thoughts with us as well. I think you should adjourn the meeting. <laughs> no, the summaries have been very good. You heard me this morning. The question is whether we have the resolve to tackle these problems ourselves. And that is the key. If you have the resolve, you must try and you will achieve something. Not all of it, but you will achieve something. It's that will, that resolution, that self-assurance that will drive us forward towards greater unity, towards greater cooperation, and achieve results. But you must believe in what you are doing, what you are professing, and what you are mobilizing your colleagues and your people around. Ah, let me finish with another story. This is a different one. But it's a question of resolve and self-assertion, self-recognition. I think I saw Mr. Butiku here somewhere. He was the private secretary to Molimo. I remember in one, one time when we were coming back from the United Nations, and uh, the, the, uh, the aircraft had, well, you have to get off the aircraft in London and then get another aircraft, British Airways, to get back to Dar es Salaam. That's an African proverb. We have been planting our corn, watering it, and then during harvest we walk away. Or we hand it to others. And we have to ask ourselves, can we do things differently? Ladies and gentlemen, and with your permission, Mr. President, can I allow a professor to give you a one-minute brief of the key outcomes of this panel session? Can we do that? Yes? Asante. Then let me call Professor Tewa just very, very briefly. Professor, I give you literally um, one minute. Thank you. Okay, two. <laughs> your Excellency. Dr. John Pombe Magufuli, President of the United Republic of Tanzania, High Excellency Mama Samia Sulu, Vice President, United Republic of Tanzania, His Excellency, President Benjamin Mkapa, our Chairman for the Africa Leadership Forum 2019, Excellencies, former Presidents, distinguished guests and participants. The purpose of this brief intervention in the program is to brief His Excellency on where we are up to now in our two days meeting. Your Excellency, President Magufuli, first and foremost, this is the sixth Africa Leadership Forum which is being held here in Dar es Salaam. Our theme is promoting good natural resource management for socioeconomic transformation in Africa. And we are meeting here for two days, 29th and 30th, that's today and tomorrow. The objective of our meeting is to reflect on uh, the potential for land, wildlife, fishery, forestry in fostering socio-economic transformation in Africa and address the noted widespread unsustainable use across the continent as well as anticipated socio-economic environment and climate change consequences. The uh, two days meeting will facilitate regional discussions among African uh, countries on these matters who are very well represented in this room. In attendance, as you've already noted, and very actively participating. We are grateful to have His Excellence uh, Olesuguno Obasanjo, former President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellence Tabombeki, former President of the Republic of South Africa, His Excellence Harry Rajao Nari Mampianina, former President of the Democratic Republic of Madagascar, His Excellence Hassan Mahmoud, former President of the Republic of Somalia, and His Excellency, Jakayam Risho Kikwete, 
uh, former president of the United Republic of Tanzania. In attendance also, we have heads of multinational and uh, United Nations organizations, regional economic communities, and leaders from business, government, civil societies, organization, academia from across Africa. Up to now, we have uh, received a welcoming remarks and a keynote address from uh, His Excellency Benjamin William Mkapa. And uh, from there on, his uh, keynote address has generated uh, discussions which are exploring basically the challenges of the environment in an African context, the basic issues regarding management of land, wildlife, fishery, forestry, all of these ones have surfaced in the discussions until now, and particularly how they are linked to fostering socioeconomic transformation. Uh, we have shared up to now some examples of good practices, experiences, and lessons of uh, even uh, in combating illicit practices like uh, fishery uh, resources which are being um, uh, deployed uh, unsustainably. Key messages which have come out until now, and in a very nutshell, first and foremost is the need for mindset change, for the need for us to change our mindsets in a diverse way, even from how we look at our resources and appreciate that Africa is rich, etc. How are we uh, contending with uh, global challenges on tapping our resources? Another issue which has come up is education. Across the floor, everybody now is appreciating the fact that we need to build in our education system ways of imparting skills such that our future generations are more able than probably ourselves in managing our natural resources. Another aspect which has come up and it has been expressed in various ways is the need to enhance the political will and leaders' readiness to make a change in this particular space. You found us discussing on issues which I can summarize as the need for joint efforts across Africa, and particularly when we enter into the global sphere, and particularly the scramble for natural resources which are abundant in Africa. In the next sessions, we will cover more uh, um, aspects with regard to the basic principles of managing land, wildlife, fishery, and forestry to achieve maximum benefits. These are basic principles. What is it that we really need to grasp and put into practice in our countries? We will dwell more on the illicit practices which are there across wildlife, fishery, and forestry. And lastly, we will wind up by looking into climate change and its impact on natural resources. Your Excellence, I beg to submit. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, would you like to say a word? The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm going to use this Swahili. Mwishmiwa Samia Suru Makamu wa Raisi wa Jamhuri ya Muungano wa Tanzania. Mwishmiwa Mzee Mkapa. Mwishmiwa Mzee Abasanjo. Mwishmiwa Tabo Mbeki. Mwishmiwa Mzee Jakaya Mlisho Kikwete. Mwishmiwa Hassan Muhammad. Mwishmiwa Harry Raja Onarima Pian. Nina waheshimiwa mabarozi na wawakilishi wa mashirika ya kimataifa ndugu wa shiriki wa jukwaa la uongozi wa Afrika wageni wa alikwa mabibi na mabwana asara mareku wa viongozi ni heshima kubwa sana kwangu kupata fursa hii Adim ya kuzungumza kwenye mkutano huu muhimu kwa mstakabali wa bara letu la Afrika. Natambua kuwa huu ni mkutano wa sita 
tangu kuanzishwa kwa jukwaa la uongozi la Afrika mwaka 2014 na mmekuwa mkifanya mikutano kama hii katika nchi mbalimbali lakini mwaka huu mmeamua kwa mara nyingine tena kufanyia Tanzania hivyo nitumie fursa hii kuwa shukuru sana kwa heshima hii kubwa kwa taifa letu napenda pia nitumie fursa hii kuwakaribisheni nyote hapa ikulu nitumie fursa hii pia kuwakaribisha na wageni wengine kutoka nchi mbalimbali mkiongozwa na marais wa staafu wa Nigeria, Tanzania, Afrika Kusini, Jamhuri ya Somalia na Madagascar. Aidha naipongeza sana ofisi ya rais mstaafu Mheshimiwa Benjamin William Mkapa pamoja na taasisi yetu ya uongozi kwa kuanzisha jukwaa la uongozi Afrika ili kushughulikia changamoto mbalimbali zinazorikabili bara letu. Mmezungumza hapa bahati nzuri katika point na mimi nime nimezisikia ni kweli usiopingika kwamba changamoto za Afrika zinatatuliwa na Waafrika wenyewe hakuna wajomba watakao kuja kutusaidia we must face our own realities no imported solution can resolve africans challenge sustainably sisi ni waafrika Tunafahamu changamoto zetu vizuri zaidi kuliko mtu mwingine yoyote. Hivyo basi nawapongeza waheshimiwa marais wa staafu kwa kuendelea kutoa mchango wenu kwenye uongozi wa nchi zetu na Afrika kwa ujumla. Uzoefu wenu unatusaidia sana sisi ambao tumepokea dhamana hizi kubwa za kuyaongoza mataifa yenu. Na katika hili naomba mniruhusu ni washukuru watangulizi wangu mlioko hapa. Mmoja yupo hapa mzee Mwinyi. Lakini mzee Mkapa yuko hapa. Na mzee Kikwete yuko hapa. Ingawa yeye anaonekana bado kijana kijana mbichi kabisa. <laughs> Na washukuru kwa ushauri mbali mbali ambao mmekuwa mkinitoa katika kuongoza nchi yetu lakini zaidi kwa kuniwezesha mimi kuchaguliwa kuwa rais mzee mwenye ndiye aliyenisimamia mchakato wa kwanza kabisa kulipeleka kuipoke, ku, ku, kuipelekea 